with so many beautiful and cozy ingredients to choose from this time of year. Autumn is my favorite season in the kitchen, so I want to invite you into my farmhouse to make some delicious things. There is always so much chatter and activity in life in this farmhouse kitchen. I watch these beautiful videos on YouTube. I love them where they include all of the sound throughout the cooking. Utensils and plates clinking together, the sound of a knife against a cutting board and the mixer kneading dough. I love that experience, but I know that that is not what you're going to get here because we have eight children here on our homestead, a lot of hungry mouths to feed, a lot of activity, and kids are always nearby helping me. <laughs> Chopping veggies with a butter knife, taking a bit of my dough to make their own little baked goods. Sometimes we can get them outside too. Luke and I just built a new playground. I say Luke and I, but I really mean Luke. We found these brackets that made it really easy on Amazon. So that helps too on some of the warmer days, but it's hustle and bustle. And that means that I need to make a lot of nourishing meals that are kid friendly and easy to throw together. We rely on a lot of the same ingredients over and over again. I get meat in bulk from my sister's farm. So we have a freezer that's well stocked with pork, beef, and chicken. Whenever she's in between harvest dates, I'll get some from fed from the farm. I have my sourdough starter always going. I have bulk flours, grains, spices, root vegetables stocked up like potatoes, garlic, onions, carrots. I buy salt in 10 pound bags. So you'll see a lot of those repeated themes throughout these simple and basic meals. I like to take those things and make them in ways that keep them a little different, a little exciting. So though I make sourdough bread nearly every single day, I'm experimenting today with sourdough pretzel buns. So I make sourdough bagels and pretzels where you take a dense dough, boil it, and bake it. Today, I'm going to combine that concept sort of and do these pretzel buns. It's a little bit different than just making regular buns, but I find this to be a really nice side for a basic soup. My family likes soup. I like making it all winter long and keeping a stock pot of bones on the stove so we always have broth but in order to make it a bit more palatable a bit more filling it's nice to pair it with some kind of carbohydrate some kind of bread and these sourdough pretzel buns are going to have to be a repeat staple because they're so good i don't yet have the recipe over on the blog it is coming very soon so check back because if you want a printable version it'll be there if you're new to my channel i blog at farmhouseonboon.com there are hundreds of sourdough recipes over there, but for these pretzel buns, if you wanna make them before I get them up, it is very, very similar to my bagel and pretzel recipes, but with some added butter to make them soft, more bun-like. So the night before you want them, mix up a half a cup of active sourdough starter, a cup of water, two teaspoons of sugar, a quarter cup of softened butter, two teaspoons of salt, and three cups of unbleached all-purpose flour. You could also substitute some whole grain flour or even all whole grain flour. They'll be a bit denser, but still really, really delicious. That will ferment overnight. In the morning, divide them in 10, shape them, allow them to rise another couple hours. I put mine in my warm spot so they rose a bit faster. And then to boil them, this time I did a ton more baking soda than I usually do to give it that golden color and that distinct pretzel flavor. So I did eight cups of water and a half a cup of baking soda, boiled them on each side for a couple minutes and then baked them for about 25 minutes at 425 degree oven. Oh, I forgot to mention before baking, I sprinkled with some coarse salt and scored them with an X, made them so beautiful. Johanna is working on her signature cheesecake this morning. She loves to bake. She loves to experiment with different flavors. And so we, of course, allow her to do that and enjoy all that that brings to our family. I'm serving our pretzel buns today 
with a basic potato soup. I browned diced bacon in the pot, removed it, sauteed diced potatoes, onions, and garlic until nice and soft, added some broth, which I have going on the stove. I'm keeping a perpetual stock pot going a lot this winter. That's my goal to keep adding more bones in. Uh, vegetable scraps like celery tops and carrots and peels and then just strain that off as needed. I also added in some milk and cream, salt and pepper to taste. I'm gonna take that basic soup, top it with the reserved bacon, parsley, shredded cheddar cheese, and serve it with a pretzel bun, which tastes so good. When you dip it in that soup, what can be more cozy and comforting on a chilly fall or winter day than a classic potato soup? In our home, I like to keep high quality cookware and bakeware for all of the many pursuits that we do here in the kitchen. I get asked about the bakeware nonstop because I'm always making different sourdough creations, brioche, babka, sandwich loaves. I love my caraway baking set and my caraway cookware. Not only do they focus on high quality, non-toxic ingredients in their products, but also they make a focus on everything being very beautiful. Their cookware sets come in colors for all different decor styles from cream to navy. They have a really sharp looking green as well as yellow and bright pink if that's the vibe of your home. After seeing the colors they've added in the last couple years since I first got my Caraway cookware set, there's other colors. I'm like, man, I really would like to get those into my kitchen because they are just so beautiful. They're also effective because they're non-stick, they're lightweight. Each set, whether it's the bakeware or the cookware, comes with organizers so that you can store them beautifully up in a cabinet. They have a canvas door hanger for lids. The bakerware sets also come in beautiful colors and have everything you need from loaf pans to muffin tins to a really large sheet pan, a smaller sheet pan, nine by 13, a circle pan. As you're thinking through your Christmas list this year, consider Caraway. With the high quality materials, the beautiful colors, it's certainly to be well loved by anybody on your list. We need to revamp our food storage system. Caraway just added some very beautiful storage where I'm excited to get my hands on as well. Caraway Homes non-toxic kitchenware features a chemical free ceramic coating so that food can be prepared with peace of mind that no hard to pronounce chemicals will leach into your healthy ingredients. You can save up to 20% site-wide on Caraway products, including their internet famous non-toxic cookware set and new product releases. This is Caraway's biggest sale of the year and this exclusive deal won't last long. So make sure to shop your favorite colors and products while you still can using my link in the description box below. Thank you so much to Caraway for sponsoring today's video. Sourdough pastry dough is something that I wanna keep in my fridge at all times. You can prep it ahead, allow it to do its ferment, and then do the lamination step. And then once it's sitting in the refrigerator, you can leave it in there for, I've done a week, I don't know, maybe you could do it longer, you could definitely freeze it. To have it on hand for making little pastry braids, individual pastries. I'm gonna make a pizza style, like a pastry tart today. There are so many different things that you can do with it. Once you get less intimidated by the whole lamination process, which I feel like I am now because I've done it a few times. I've cut a few corners where I only do the folds a couple times versus a lot more whenever I was doing the sourdough croissants. So it doesn't feel that difficult. And I didn't measure this time. Usually I'll measure 
how big the dough is, how big the little butter placket or packet, I forget what people call it, is. This time I didn't and it still turned out awesome. So the way you do this, I'll explain the, the whole process in a nutshell, and then you could head over to the blog for these specific amounts. A couple nights before you want this, mix up the dough in a mixer. You can also do it by hand. It's just a basic dough. It does have eggs in it, which means it's an enriched dough. Whenever you have a sourdough that is just water, salt, flour, and starter, that is a basic bread recipe. Whenever you add butter or eggs, you are enriching it. These kind of doughs can rise a little bit longer. Learned this just recently whenever I had Ashley Turner from Turner Farm on my podcast. So I have a podcast called Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. She was on and she was explaining the reason why when you make a brioche dough and it has tons of butter in it and eggs, it can sit on your counter without over fermenting for a lot longer. I noticed this, but didn't really think about the science behind it when you add fat it takes longer to rise and ferment. So since this has that, you can leave it out on your counter for extended periods of time. Now what I usually recommend is about four hours and then pop it in the fridge for about eight hours. This time I let mine sit out overnight and then I put it in the fridge in the morning just to let it firm up before doing the lamination. Now what lamination means is you take some butter and you roll it in several layers inside the dough to create these flaky, beautiful layers. So I put some butter and parchment, put that in between my rolled out pastry dough, enclosed it like an envelope, then rolled it out, folded it, put it back in the fridge, and then again, rolled it out, folded it, put it back in the fridge. Now at that point, after those two folds, you can let it sit in your fridge for a really long time and get it out whenever you want something with pastry dough. It's really good on top of a ground beef pot pie, a chicken pot pie. You can of course do something sweet. I was thinking about how beautiful it would be to maybe braid into some kind of wreath as a gift or make a pastry braid wrap it real tight before baking with some plastic, put it in the freezer, and then have it thawed out for Christmas morning. Kind of like they used to sell these fundraisers when I was a kid for butter braids. And it's just like that. We've made this into a pastry braid. It tastes just like that. Highly recommended to keep this on hand. It's a very impressive looking thing, but it really doesn't take much effort once you're really familiar with the process. It took me a while to get to the place where I feel like it's not intimidating, but that's because when you understand the process for something and there's no mental thought, the actual effort isn't much. It's just thinking about, okay, what steps next? I have to refer back to the recipe. feels very confusing. I love when I get to this place with a recipe where I feel like I can do it without having to constantly refer back, look at the directions, reread them. That's kind of where I feel like I am with this. sauteed mushrooms, garlic, onion with butter, added in balsamic vinegar, a little soy sauce, topped it with cheese, added some fresh thyme. Luke said this was the best thing he ever ate. I don't know if he was being dramatic, but I will say that it was quite tasty. Many mornings I will get something going in the oven first thing. So that way we can either have it for lunch, we can have it for dinner. I'll do this with a roast, with a whole chicken. Really any cut, most cuts anyways, can benefit from low and slow cooking. We have somewhere to be this morning and so I'm getting a chicken going. Not totally sure what I will use it for. Doesn't really matter as long as you have things going in your kitchen. The same would go for sourdough, for a bone broth pot. I try to keep the kitchen active and functioning whenever we're home, not necessarily having to give a whole lot of thought to when we'll use what or what it will go with, just knowing that at some point 
we will find something to do with bread, something to do with chicken, something to do with broth. These kind of staples make it to where a from scratch nourishing meal is never too far away as long as they're always going. I know with things like sourdough, people get really worried about the timing. I will start sourdough just about any time of the day. If it's evening, say it's 7 p.m., I will do stretch and folds every 20 minutes or so between seven and nine-ish. Sometimes I'll do less stretch and folds because I'm ready to go to bed. Sometimes we're still up and so I'll keep developing that gluten. I will put it in a cooler space if it needs to sit out for a long time. So away from my warming stove spot as far as I can get from that. If I need to leave it out for 12 hours, if I need to leave it out for a really long time, I'll put it in the fridge. But I start sourdough bread at night often. I'll let it rise on the counter, not on my stove spot, till morning, divide it, shape it, let it rise another hour or so in the bannetons, and then bake it the next day. I do this a lot, even though technically the best time to start bread would probably be sometime in the afternoon, letting it bulk ferment till about bedtime, dividing it, shaping it, putting it in bannetons, putting it in the fridge, then scoring and baking the next day. I follow this rule so infrequently, mostly because I don't like to plan out our meals quite that much. I just really make an effort and an emphasis on keeping our kitchen well stocked with basics, with things that will last a while, keeping the freezer stock, the pantry stock, and then just cook like crazy whenever I get the chance. So if the baby is being good or somebody's pushing him on the swing or I have any extra time, keep chopping veggies, keep cooking meats, getting a sourdough going, maybe getting some sourdough bagels going. Those are some of my favorite things to get going whenever there is a little bit of extra time. Not worrying too much about what's on the other end of that. If you have a large family like us, especially, this works because we are always home, always eating. And so there isn't really a time where I could prepare too much food unless we're planning to go out of town or something, in which case I try to shut things down. But as long as we're home, there's really not uh, enough food that we couldn't eat. And if I got to a point where I made too much, doesn't happen. But if I did, I could always freeze it. So today I'm taking the chicken I made earlier that I picked off the bone, putting it in the slow cooker for a white wine chicken soup. So I'm doing bacon again. Yes, bacon makes it into way too many things, probably because we just got a whole hog from my sister's farm and I'm still trying to use up a bunch of bacon and sausage that I purchased from fed from the farm, all good, clean, local sources. So I'm putting bacon in a lot of things because we got to make room in our freezer. Our hog is still sitting at my parents' house in their freezer since Ashley, my sister, runs her farm out of there. They have a big walk-in freezer. And so it's still sitting there. So yes, bacon is making it into everything. You wouldn't have to use bacon for this soup. You could just use butter for your fat. I'm using bacon grease for my fat, sauteing those basic ingredients again, like I keep doing, the onion, the garlic, the carrot, the potato, adding in broth, white wine, a little bit of that balsamic and Worcestershire, salt, pepper, some herbs, and then I will use this sourdough, same day sourdough. I've explained this before, but I do make sourdough all in one day, start it in the morning and have it by dinner. This time my starter was active on the counter. There have been times where I've made it even just from cold starter, put it in a really warm spot to accelerate the process. The more corners you cut with sourdough, uh, the more liberties you take, you don't get a perfect prize winning product, but we make so much bread. I'm going for edible and, and honestly, it's always very delicious. But whenever I follow everything to a T, that's when I get that beautiful Instagram worthy bread. Most of the time I'm just looking for sustenance, something to serve with these hearty soups and stews. So my family has a well-balanced meal. Speaking of not following protocol, not doing things by the book, I totally forgot to preheat my Dutch oven when I was ready to start baking this bread. So the first loaf is even going into a cold Dutch oven. 
I did not put it in the fridge before scoring it, which also makes for a better loaf of bread. Again, it still is great. I'm going to serve it tonight, toasted with butter, with our chicken stew. So many soups happen this time of year. Just take any vegetable you can get your hands on, saute it, add some meat, add some broth, and call it a dinner. Bonus points if you can get something sourdough with it too. I'm not a huge make ahead, bake ahead, and freeze type of person. I'll do it if I have extra. I don't usually intend to do it, but if you did that and you pre-sliced it through some pre-sliced bread into the toaster, that would be great too. Stepping into the pantry today to grab some staples for one of my favorite meals to make any time of the year, risotto. The reason I like it is it uses up a whole lot of bone broth, which is very healthy and nourishing. The kids really like it, and I almost always have what it takes to make it on hand. Gonna use bacon again. I didn't even notice until I was editing this video just how much bacon I used in this. I'm sure some of you are gonna say, how is this healthy? You have bacon. I believe whenever you get bacon from a trusted quality source, someone that is raising their pigs with non-GMO on pasture, uh, you're gonna get a good product that can be good for you. I said it, I said it. Lard can be good for you. That's the fat that comes from bacon. Whenever an animal is raised in a way that isn't the best for health in mind, a lot of the negative aspects of that practice are concentrated in the fat. So I only like to use bacon fat whenever I get it from a trusted source, which I have in this case. Like I said with the soup, you don't have to use lard as your fat. You can use butter or olive oil or coconut oil. I've done all of those things. Today I'm sauteing my onions and my rice in the reserved bacon fat. I like to slowly cook the onions until they are caramelized and then coat the rice as well with the fat, cook that until it's a bit browned, add some wine, and then saute for a little bit longer, cooking off a little bit of alcohol from white wine. I do use a lot of wine in my cooking. I think it's really delicious. One of my favorite ways to do it is to sear a chicken breast on both sides get it really nice and dark, and then add in some wine to deglaze the pan, cook that down a bit. A lot of times I'll add some cream after that, make like a creamy sauce. Just can't replace the taste of wine in that. The key to making a creamy risotto is to add broth slowly and stir it often. I give this job to one of my kids a lot of times. You don't wanna have it on high heat so that the liquid evaporates fast. It's meant to be a slow process. So add a little broth, keep stirring, add a little bit more broth, keep stirring until all of the broth is absorbed and it's nice and creamy. This time I could have actually stood to have a bit more broth, but I need to get more going. I don't have any more just yet. I top this with Parmesan cheese, parsley, and bacon. I hope that you got some cozy meal ideas and I hope that you will join me in my next video here in our farmhouse. Mm -hmm.